You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. All right, how's it going? And thanks for checking out the Straight to Video podcast. I've got a really great in-depth chat on today's show with a guy who I've been trying to get on the show since I very first started. When I began putting the pieces together last year and reaching out to a bunch of people, today's guest Stevie Rochelle was on that original list and we finally did it. Stevie is a guy who has been a massive influence on my musical journey from right back to simply being a fan of his band Tough back in the early 90s after reading about them in, I think it was Metal Forces magazine, as the band that was about to get a record deal on the Sunset Strip. They would eventually get signed by Atlantic Records and release their debut album, What Comes Around Goes Around, which turns 30 years old this year and is celebrated by a deluxe re-release, which is in the manufacturing stages right now as we speak. Other than just being a great rock and roll band, Tough really embodied fan interaction with one of the coolest fan clubs out there, the amazingly titled Tough Muff Fan Club, which I was a proud member of. I think that alone ignited a passion for always trying to do cool merchandise ideas and make sure everyone who ordered something from any band I would go on to be involved in always enjoyed and felt was great value to them as a fan and supporter. Stevie would go on to launch the massively influential website Metal Sludge in the late 1990s and it became an essential online resource for fans of a genre of music which other media outlets refused to cover. It did it in such a great, fun, tongue-in-cheek way too and today it is still the go-to website for latest news on all my favourite bands. I've been lucky enough to get to know Stevie a little over the years and back in 2006 our band got the opportunity to tour the east coast of the USA with our friends The Erotics, Sweden's Veins of Jenna and Stevie Rochelle himself as part of the Metal Sludge Extravaganza Tour. It really was an amazing experience to do shows with all these musicians and to have Stevie along with us too. One story which I'm sure I've shared with many people, but perhaps not on this podcast, is one that shows how cool Stevie is to anyone he works or interacts with. We were coming to the end of the tour and played at Arlene's Grocery in Manhattan. Stevie was managing the band Veins of Jenna and they were killing it every night. They caught the attention of Bam Margera from Jackass and he came along to the show and was interested in signing the band to his new record label. The following night we did a show in Philadelphia and as was usually the case, after the gig we'd load up our gear and head off and try and find a hotel. TCC were travelling with the Erotics and Stevie and the Veins guys would head out and find a hotel too. It would often be a different hotel or one band would have something pre-booked. Anyway, on this particular night I seem to remember we were driving forever to find somewhere, low on fuel too. We eventually pulled up at a random hotel which was midway between where we played and on the way to the next gig. Check the hotel cost and in we went, sorted. I even think I remember logging onto the hotel's computer to check on MySpace messages too, way before Facebook and long before you could do that stuff on your phone. Anyway, next morning there's a knock on our door and it's the Veins of Jenna guys. I have no idea how they ended up checking into the same hotel as us. There must have been dozens of different hotels on that route from the previous night's gig, but they did. Okay, it's a coincidence, no big deal though, right? Well... It was kind of cool because it turned out that Bam Margera had been so impressed when he saw the band that he immediately wanted them to come out and shoot a video for their song No One's Gonna Do It For You, which would mean they'd miss the rest of the tour. This was so cool for them and we totally understood, so the fact they'd ended up in the same hotel at least meant we got to hang out one last time and say some goodbyes, which if you've been on any kind of tour, that's kind of important. Stevie came into our room to share the news and both Rob Wilde and I headed out to Stevie's van to say goodbye. Whilst there, Stevie basically told us to fill our boots with absolutely any CDs and merch we wanted. Now in most cases, on most tours, that would mean a CD and a t-shirt, but we're talking about Stevie Rochelle of Tough here, the king of merch and marketing. This guy had brought out dozens of different CDs on the road, the whole Tough catalogue, DVDs, other label releases, Tough shirts, sludge shirts, everything you could think of. Basically, Wilde and I were in glam rock heaven. We were like hard rock scavengers sat on the grass in the burning morning sun loading up on hair metal treasure. That's how cool Stevie is, and I still have all that stuff today. Things like that really mean a lot to me, so thank you, Stevie. Fast forward to just a couple of weeks to when I got home. I saw that video on MTV, and the Veins guys would end up opening for Poison on their US tour, which was amazing. So back to present day and Stevie is all set to re-release the debut Tough album and I've heard the remastered tracks and they sound huge. I pretty much wore the album out on cassette when I got it back in the day so it's great to hear those songs sounding so fresh and exciting again. 
The packaging is going to be great too, with a vinyl release on either black, white, or glorious Tough Purple. And there's some great bundles available over at toughcds.com. Whilst we cover a lot of stuff on today's chat week, only really scratch the surface, so I urge you to check out Stevie's Tough Diaries, which are on the Metal Sludge website at metalsludge.tv, which are a really in-depth insight into what it was like to be in a band during the heyday of the Hollywood Sunset Strip and beyond. If you do a little digging on the Sludge website, you might even come across 10 questions with Teenage Casket Company too, back when we were all snotty take-on-the-world arseholes. Before we get into this fun chat with Stevie Rochelle, please spare some time to visit our friends at Dead Skull Coffee, where you can grab a sweet 15% discount off their quality ground or full bean coffee. Simply fill your cart at deadskullcoffee.co.uk and add the promo code STV on checkout, and the hefty discount will be applied as a thank you for listening to this show. Right, let's do this. Stevie was on top form during our chat. There's so, so much more I could have spoken to him about, but this guy has enough stories for 10 bands and then some. So if you want to hear more, then after our talk, maybe check out some other cool interviews that Stevie has done recently with our buddy Chuck Shute on the Chuck Shute podcast and also a chat with Jason Green on Waste Some Time with Jason Green Show. Both are a lot of fun, but right now, sit back and enjoy being transported back to late 80s Hollywood as I have my straight-to-video chat with Stevie Rochelle. What's up, man? How are you? I'm good. Hey, dude, first of all, thanks for doing this. No worries, mate. I'm glad we finally get a chance to sit down and have a chat. It's been a long time. Hey, check this out. Got this bad boy on the wall from many, many years ago. Oh, the, the sludge uh, the sludge poster. The Veins of Jenna Erotics TCC tour in 2006, 15 years ago. Wow. <laughs> Fuck. Can you believe it's been that long? I can believe it's been that long, but it's gone frigging fast. Crazy fast. I know. Unreal. Well, you know, the crazy thing, I've said this to some other people, as far back ago as the strip was, for me, 34 years ago, I came here. In that time going forward, I probably won't be here. Yeah, that's when reality sinks in. Yeah, unless I live to 89, which is fucking unlikely. Most people don't make 89 or 90. Time's got to be weird at the moment, like perception of time. Because I was thinking this today, the album is like 30 years old. If you'd have transported back 30 years from 1991, that's like pre-Beatles. <laughs> right. Well, that's what somebody else I read, somebody was saying online, that, you know, going back a couple of decades now seems, it seems like a long time ago, but not that long. But if we would have been doing that in the 80s or the 90s, now you're talking 50s or 60s. Crazy. It's funny. You'll, you'll probably appreciate this with like a barometer of time. I always judged it on Motley Crue's decade of decadence and which happened within that band and that changed within that 10 year span now 10 years just goes by like nothing yeah they had the perfect i mean they released too fast for love in 81 shout at the devil 83 theater of pain 85 girls 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 87 dr feel good 89 Nuts. i mean they were like the consummate band that just hit everything right the nail on the head through the entire decade and everything was different each time total transformation yeah it was <laughs> crazy matter of fact i even I have this. This is the first one I bought. So I bought this like in early 84 and it's still uh, vinyls just destroyed. Um, it's all scratched up. Where'd you buy it from, Stevie? What was the shop called? The exclusive company in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. That's where I bought all my records when I was you know, a teenager. Probably paid about five ninety nine for it. When did all that stuff get transported over to the West Coast? Oh, you mean some of the stuff that I have from back home? 
Little by little, you know, because I moved here in 87. And when I came here, I came on a one-way flight with one suitcase. That's it. Nothing else. No vinyl records in that. <laughs> Nothing. No. And then as a couple of years went by, when we started touring, every time I'd go through Wisconsin in a bus or whatever, van, truck, trailer, whatever, I'd stop by my, my mom's house and be like, hey, I'm going to throw this in the bus and bring it home with me. Whether it was some clothes or... You know, and at some point there was like, hey, I'm going to bring my records. So I had a whole bunch of like milk crates and we were like at a rider truck with tons of room. So I just put some of my shit in the back of it. And then, you know, a month later, touring around the U.S., I end up back in L.A. and now I have it. So I never shipped anything. I only took it whenever we toured through there. I'd pick something up. I really enjoyed your chat with Chuck on the Chuck Shoot podcast. He's a good dude. He is a good dude. He's got a great interview technique as well. The, the amount of stuff he can cover within an hour right. is unreal. I just let people go and tell the story, but he's like, every two minutes, he'll get on to the next thing. Yeah. He's great at it. You know, the thing is, I haven't done a lot of this stuff during this pandemic. A ton of bands are doing all this Zoom stuff. They're like, I had guys reach out to, they're like, hey, do you want to be involved in one of these jams? So-and-so is going to play drums. This guy's going to do the guitar, blah, blah, blah. And you can do the vocals and record your stuff here, do it at home. Then we're going to film it and put it. And I was like, eh. Wasn't really into that. You know, I felt like some of the, the live shows that some people put on, and I won't name names, but for instance, the Monsters of Rock crews put on those live things from the studio and they look fucking amazing. I mean, the digital screens and just everything was so great. But then at the same time, I'm like, okay, we're sitting in a room playing for nobody, you know, the crew and some staff, and there's four or five or six high def, 1080 PI cameras right here, right in your face. And hey, as guys are getting older, you know, 50, 55 extra pounds, less hair, nose hairs, whatever. Like at some point, <laughs> some of the video footage, I was like, ah, I don't know if I want to see that. Like seeing Motley Crue in 83 uh, on one of those high def camera angles with like Kiss would do or something, or even Tuff in 86, 88, 89, 90. Awesome. But not to mention my band is spread all over. Todd's in Ohio with Billy. T who plays drums with me is in Arizona. I'm in LA. Jimmy, who we also use for drums is in like Kentucky. Howie's a, a, a sub guitar player, Howie Simon, which we've used and he's somewhere in LA as well. But I would have to literally fly like two or three guys here or there and then hang out for a few days, rehearse some songs only to play for 45 minutes one time. It didn't make sense. Like if we all lived in the same area, then we could maybe do it a little bit more. I just took it as a, you know, the pandemic was a time when I was working on a whole bunch of things, including this What Comes Around Goes Around remaster, which has been a, a long process, a lot of hoops to jump through, a lot of legwork, a lot of people. Have you been trying to do it for a while and it just kind of everything aligned with it being the 30th anniversary? Not really. No, I mean, I've, I've dug around a couple times in the past. But, you know, in the last several years, more and more labels, the Rock Candies and different things like this have, have started to do these deals. Brian Pereira and uh, Tim over at Deadline Cleopatra, they licensed Pretty Boy Floyd's Leather Boys with Electric Toys a few years ago and then put out a you know special edition vinyl. You know, and I have, you know, an indie label. I've been making my own records forever, but I, I understand that my indie label is not the same thing as Deadline Cleopatra or Rock Candy or, or Frontiers. I mean, those guys are at a whole other level. There's a lot of little things you got to do. It's time consuming. But last year, I really started to dig in early in the year. Had some favors through a friend and this guy, and this guy knows that person and this person can help with that guy. And suddenly I got it in and one person led to another to another. And then by some point late last year, they gave me the go ahead. So I, I basically got a memo deal to do the deal with Rhino Entertainment, which is a Warner Music Group. But I thought, OK, well, now that this is going to happen, I'm not going to push it in 2020 because last year was a nightmare. COVID, everything was happening. And then I thought, OK, well, six, eight months from now, it's going to be the 30th anniversary. It makes more sense to do it on the 30th anniversary as opposed to the 29th anniversary. Also, by letting 2020 resolve and go away and part of 2021 has started to come full circle now with shows. It was the perfect time and to announce it. it. Sounds amazing, by the way. Awesome. I was hearing stuff I've never heard on my cassette. And I've had other people say that. Even Todd Chase was like, dude, I'm hearing shit on these songs. I don't remember recording. <laughs> and then, you know, we started tweaking with the artwork. 
and going through all the process, which to do a deal like that, there's certain things you have to do. You can't just do it whatever way you want. You have to get certain things approved. And the, like, for instance, the album cover has to stay the same. They don't allow you to change the artwork on the cover. Do you have one of these on vinyl? No. I only actually got it on CD maybe in the last right? 12 months or so. But I always had it on cassette. This is the Atlantic vinyl. What's crazy as a kid growing up, and as we all know, when you open records and you see those you know, RCA logo or Warner Brothers or whatever, from all the stuff we listened to, whether it was Genesis, ACDC, Elton John, to see that... Just those colors straight away. Yeah, and that, that Atlantic logo, which, <laughs> and then it says tough, you know, like this was only printed on vinyl in Europe, not in America, only in Europe. And so the original Atlantic was just the vinyl in the white sleeve like this. And then the cover is the same, obviously, but the back is actually, it's all the thank yous. Yeah, it does look kind of weird like that. Yeah, it does look kind of weird <laughs> with the songs over here. So when I went to go do the RLS remastered version, they told me I had to leave the cover the same and the tray card the same. The new RLS vinyl, it'll be set up like the original CD on the back. But then there's a full color insert, multi-page insert inside the vinyl, which will have all the lyrics, all the credits. Because having the credits on the back, that just... That doesn't look that great, you know. Plus, there's an option. You could get traditional black vinyl, purple, or white. You had to do purple. You had to do the purple. Right, yeah. And then with the CD booklet, we went from 12 pages to 16 and, and also added photos, like uh, solo shots from the merry-go-round, which have never been seen, of George on a horse, Todd on a horse. I only recently learned that was in on the Santa Monica Pier. Santa Monica Pier. Yeah, Ray put the Ned locations thing. I was like, holy right. shit. <laughs> yeah, it's still there. And so in the, the original booklet, for everybody playing along at home, you can just listen. The booklet itself is 12 pages, but it's pretty bland. It's just black with white text. And even the way they set up the lyrics and stuff, like, look, the first lyric starts, there's a blank spot where then the next song starts. And then it ends up here. And then there's another blank spot. And then this one starts here and goes there to the other side. And so, you know, the inside of the booklet was a little, could have been desirable in, in other formats. Putting shit right 30 years later. Right, exactly. And there's actually a couple other little surprises related to the products, which are both in the manufacturing phase. But I'm not letting all the cat out of the bag until they actually get their package and go, what the fuck? Oh, my God, this is insane. So, yeah, we got a couple of tricks up our sleeve and it, it looks and sounds amazing. And freaking dog tags are back as well. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Printed a bunch of stuff anniversary-like. You know, uh, 30th anniversary of what comes around goes around 91 to 2021. Dog tags and some getting some pins made and some guitar pick packs and some other miscellaneous items, promo kind of stuff. I don't know if you listened to my um, interview with Scotty Dunbar a few weeks ago and we were talking about fan clubs and the Tough Muff fan club was like head and shoulders above. I mean, this was before you'd even signed your deal, I think. Right. It's still like heads and tails above everybody else. Where did that come from? Was you was you guys members of any kind of fan clubs or did you just love the whole merchandising idea? I mean, I was never officially a member of any fan club, but I do remember, you know, getting records and opening up the Motley Crue Shout at the Devil, for instance, and they had that, what was it called? The Sin Club or something like that in there. I might have sent away $10 for something for a newsletter or two, but, and obviously Kiss had always been really at the forefront of making their packages super cool. Tough was already doing a a lot of merchandise years before we got signed as you know we were doing posters before anybody local bands were doing flyers and we were doing we were doing this <laughs> have you ever seen that i've never seen that now pretty fucking badass huh <laughs> yeah super so they were going out in mailing tubes all over the country probably all over the world yeah well what we would do is we and there's another po that's I think that's 80, maybe that's 88. That's about an 18 by 24 wall poster. After that, we did another one. It's even bigger. It's like the ones that you would buy at the Spencer's or the Walgreens and the poster thing. And at the time, we were also doing super high-end photo shoots. Even though we weren't immediately in demand, Michael would call up the William Hames, Niels Lowe's those kind of people and say, hey, we want to do a photo shoot. 
And at some point, if they weren't willing to do it for free, they'd be like, okay, it's 500 bucks or 750 bucks. We would pay 750 bucks, go to their studio, do the 10 rolls of color, couple rows of solo shots, the super high end, hire a makeup artist, get everybody, we'd get clothes made for a month before the shoot. So by the time we showed up and we walked in, they're like, holy fuck. Even the photographers at that point had, had kind of taken notice that we weren't just like a couple local guys that showed up. We rolled in with like, you know, wardrobe and hairstylists and makeup artists. And, you know, we had, we had a vision from the beginning, a lot of it led by Michael, our drummer. We always wanted to present ourselves at a much higher level. So when bands were pasting our flyers everywhere, which we did, we would also find places to glue those posters this big, you know, when we try to get gigs at clubs, whether it was in Texas, Salt Lake, Chicago, Kansas City, Minneapolis, you know, wherever, St. Louis, we would call clubs blindly. And of course, this as everybody knows, this is way before the internet, we'd find out, oh, uh, Warrant went on tour, Dangerous Toys went on tour, and they played a club called First Rock in St. Louis. Let's call them. So we literally, you know, find out what the number was for First Rock and call this club and say, we want to speak to the booking agent. I remember this is a club that was in St. Louis. We called, got this woman on the phone named Lynn. And she said, I'm the manager. We said, we want to play your club. And she said, okay, you know, who are you? What label you on? This, that. We're like, we're not on a label. We're from LA. This was in the early part of 89. We were pitching her because we were going to go on tour through the Midwest that summer. And she's like, well, send me a promo package and I'll take a look at you guys. So we sent a promo package. And of course, the 24 by 36 poster where we looked like, you know, Motley Crue meets Poison. She got the package and then she put the posters up in the club and said, coming soon. And then that weekend, she said that she had literally everybody that walked in the club said, that tough band, when are they coming? I want to go to the show. And she called us the next day and she's like, I want to book you guys. You know, what's the date? And we're like, well, we're going to be there between in that area between like June 25th and July 6th. Pick a night. She's like, I want this night. And, and we're like, OK, how much? She offered us like 500 bucks which was a guarantee for a no name band. But she's like, based on the fact that I put your poster on the wall and every girl wanted to know when the show was. <laughs> and so then when we played that show, we got there at Soundcheck and we met the band Broken Toys, which was fronted by Frankie Muriel, the blonde David Lee Roth meets Prince. And we were like, who the fuck are these guys? And we made friends with Frankie and Jimmy and all those guys that day. And as everybody knows, going forward, they got signed and they changed their name to King of the Hill. So that's where we met King of the Hill. That was the summer of 89. And that's how we used to do. We used to basically build ourselves to a level where we couldn't be denied. And then we'd kind of pitch it to clubs. And they all took it. Kansas City, St. Louis, Minneapolis, Thirsty Whale in Chicago. You know, T.A. Vern's in Milwaukee, all over Austin, Dallas, Houston, Albuquerque, Salt Lake. And we just started building. And then we'd call the promoters and say, well, we have these three dates open this week and these three dates open that week. And they'd be like, we're in Iowa. We'll take this date. And we'd be like, "Okay, makes sense. We can get there. It's 300 miles and little by little built it. The power of a good photograph, sir. So I I got on a tangent there. Back to the fan club. By the time we actually got signed, our manager, Brian Kushner from Power Star, also managed Britney Fox. A guy named David Snowden, he worked with KISS for a long time. He's involved with the KISS world. He ran fan clubs for Britney Fox, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. He might have done some kind of KISS-related stuff. I mean, I know he did KISS-related stuff. I don't know if he did their official fan club. But David Snowden is on the East Coast in Baltimore. And because our manager uh, had Britney Fox, he then took us on as well. And we had already had a, a huge name. But at this point, we couldn't really do it all anymore. Because we were getting so big and we were now signed and going to go on the road, we couldn't man a P.O. box if we were going to be gone for six or eight months out of the year. So David Snowden took over the fan club. And then between him and the band and Michael, we said, let's put together the most awesome fan club package ever, which included the school folder, the dog tag, the sticker, the backstage pass, the postcards, individual shots, group shots, all the different individual eight by tens. Guitar picks. Guitar picks pamphlet that had like the questionnaire of like ask me 10 questions and I give the answers and each month it was printed and different stuff would come in one month was Todd's month one month was George and 
So David was helping put together this massive fan club package and um, helped run that for a few years when we were at our height because we were so busy and traveling and touring, we couldn't all take care of it all because we were gone. It was so good, really was. Because most of those, you'd get an album and see, oh, join the fan club and you'd mail off and you'd probably get the, the intro package and then you'd never hear anything ever again. But yours was right. constant. Yours was the one constantly get stuff after that amazing intro package. So it was awesome. Right. Really was, really yeah. was. I'm going to throw things back. Um, Chuck covered a lot of really cool stuff in your interview, so I don't want to go over the same stuff. You grew up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which is like 2,000 miles away from California, but I would imagine, particularly in the mid to late 80s, a million miles away in terms of rock and roll identity. What can you tell us about your town as a kid? You're right. It is It is a long way away. Geographically, for anybody that doesn't know where that sits in the United States, obviously New York is on the right-hand side, the East Coast. LA is on the left-hand side, the West Coast. The South Central state is Texas. And the very North in the Midwest, the biggest city would be Chicago, which is kind of basically almost due North from Texas. Wisconsin is right above Illinois. And the Wisconsin border from Chicago is maybe 30 minutes. So then basically from Chicago going straight North, it's about a three, three and a half hour drive to Oshkosh. And on the way North from Chicago, you'll go through Milwaukee, then you'll go through a town called Fond du Lac, which people might have heard, and then Oshkosh. And then if you go another hour, you hit Green Bay. So basically, a, almost a straight line north. From Chicago, north, just under four hours is where Oshkosh is. Town of 50,000, most known for Oshkosh Bagosh, the overalls. So for somebody that has a little kid who's two and they wear the little Oshkosh Bagosh brand children's clothing, that's where it originated from. It's also a home to a big aircraft convention annually called the EAA, the Experimental Aircraft Association. And what it is, is it's all people who build experimental aircrafts. People that buy, you know, when people buy a kit car or they build something on their own in their garage, like there's people that buy airplanes, you know, in a kit, build it, put an engine in it, and then wherever they're at, Alabama, Salt Lake City, Maine, Florida, they fly to Oshkosh once a year in late July, August for this big convention. And it's all airplane related. And there's also a lot of like old war planes, P-38s, Corsairs, Japanese Zeros, all the different types of you know war planes from way back. They would come to that event as well. And then the big draw would be uh, if the Canadian... Uh, what are they called? The Snow Angels or the, I think they're called the Snow Angels. Those are like the F-15 jets that fly in unison, like eight or 10 of them together. And they do all these. So, and then they'll have um, certain celebrities that are all really into flying. I think John Travolta had been out there a few times because he was into flying. John Denver, rest in peace, who actually died in a plane crash. He was big into flying. So he would come there. Every year there'd be celebrities that were somehow involved with flying or like flying that would come into town. So the little town of Oshkosh would go from 50,000 to like a quarter of a million people in like a one week time period. There'd be people from all over the world there for this big event, all kinds of aerial shows and airplane related stuff so so a lot, it's a place a lot of people are congregate to but how is it for someone with massive dreams is it somewhere where people can escape from do you think or do people like follow in the footsteps of the parents and yeah well and that's the thing you know growing up a lot of people that i went to school with their friends or uncles or brothers or relatives were big into deer hunting deer hunting is big in wisconsin hunting in general deer hunting duck hunting pheasant hunting fishing any kind of wildlife, you know, basically what Ted Nugent stands for. That's a big thing in Wisconsin. I never took to it. I mean, I went a few times with some uncles, you know, you go to a cabin, you spend the weekend, wake up at four in the morning, go sit in a tree somewhere and somebody's waiting for a deer and they try to shoot it. And if they get it, bring it home and make sausages and venison out of it. But I just never took to the hunting thing. I never took to the, you know, snowmobiling or downhill skiing or Hockey actually was a little bit of a, a popular sport growing up as well, because we're only about probably four hours from the Canadian border in northeastern Wisconsin. So there was a lot of things that I didn't fit in with. 
So as a kid in the mid 70s, when I discovered skateboarding and then became obsessed with it to the point that me and my friends were building quarter pipes and half pipes and ramps and jumps in the driveway and in the street to, to skateboard on and living our dreams out of these magazines we would buy at the store, like Skateboard World or Skateboarder. And it would show all these cool things that originated in California. Southern California, San Diego, LA, Orange County, all the coolest skate parks, the coolest bands. All the Dogtown stuff, was it? All that kind of Yes, stuff. exactly. Dogtown with all those guys. Tony Elva, Stacy Peralta, Jay Adams, the Z Boys. And then at some point, you know, it was different groups. Like Stacy Peralta became a partner with an older man named, I think his name was George Powell. They formed Powell Peralta, which was a famous skate company. Tony Alva formed his own company called Alva Skates. Dogtown was around. And so that was like late 70s where they had the big plexiglass clear half pipe that had a Pepsi logo on it. I was obsessed with it. And aside from the skating aspect, I was now being exposed to the music that went along with skating, which was predominantly punk rock and borderline new wave. Punk meaning The Clash, The Sex Pistols, 999, Black Flag, J JFA, Jodie Foster Army. And then all the, the obscure, weird stuff that started popping up. The Boomtown Rats, the B-52s, Devo, Ice House, XTC, The Specials, Madness, some ska bands. And all of that was part of the skate culture. So that was the music I grew up listening to, the plasmatics with Wendy O. Williams, you know, listening to all that and pretty much only that as a preteen, 10, 11, 12, into my teens, 13, 14, 15, 16. And it wasn't until I was probably a junior or a senior in high school that other music, heavy metal music, started to kind of enter my, my realm, so to speak. One of the first bands I remember getting a lot of radio airplay and everybody being into was Loverboy. Canadian band with two records that had like 10 top 40 singles on it. Working for the weekend, you know, The Kid Is Hot Tonight, Gangs in the Street, just so many great songs on those two records. And everybody was listening to them and the local radio station was playing them. And then Pyromania came out by Def Leppard, 83. Pretty sure it was 83. That record was on the radio 23 hours a day. <laughs> it was like fooling, let it go, you know, photograph, whatever, just one after another. And so all of my friends or some of my friends started really listening to a lot of Loverboy, Def Leppard, hearing about Rush, Ozzy with Randy Rhodes playing guitar. And that was, you know, at that point, I started getting a little bit of the music bug. And then my friends said they wanted to go to a concert. So early 84, I went to my first concert, which was Kiss in February, Lick It Up Tour. And I remember I left there. I thought Vinnie Vincent was the coolest guy in the band. You know, he had the flashiest guitar and he was just, there was something about him. And then you look at Gene and Gene was not, an, you know, a cool looking guy, so to speak. He was, you know, looked like half a tranny in that photo. You know, he just. <laughs> Obviously, this is like the first tour without makeup. I yeah, guess. exactly. Yeah. But it was a couple of weeks later that I saw the Ozzy tour with Motley. And that was, that was the beginning of the end. Like I just became fully obsessed with the shout at the devil record, their songs, the band, who they are, what they stood for. That just turned into rat out of the cellar, Van Halen, 1984, Dokken, black and blue helix, you know, and the list goes on and on. I find that really interesting though. Cause I was going to ask, cause I knew you're going to see Ozzy and obviously Motley Crue open. That was like the light bulb holy shit moment that's interesting though that you saw kiss before then and that didn't have especially as that being like one of your first concerts and the spectacle of kiss it didn't have that kind of explosion for you no it didn't but you know let's look at it this way i mean when i saw kiss i was still 17 hadn't had my birthday yet but think about it this was 1984 kiss had already been around for over 10 years so gene and paul and i mean these guys were in their 30s and Gene, you know, Gene never looked like a young man to begin with. But, you know, looking up at Kiss as 30 some year old New York, Italian, dark hair, you know, fuck you, motherfucker. You know, just it was kind of like Jersey Shore kind of guys with longer hair. When Motley Crue came out, I mean, God, Tommy Lee was what, 21 years old on the tour and Vince was like 23 or something. Vince was like this blonde hair, tan 
beach California guy, like his appeal was like Spicoli and Brad Pitt, you know, like he was really cool looking and just like, but you look at Gene, I mean, Vince Neil shouted the devil and Gene lick it up. Those are not the same person. So it was really, I mean, if Motley Crue would have been four guys that look like Mick Mars, I probably wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been that blown away. And plus going into the Kiss concert, you perhaps knew a little bit about Kiss. I guess seeing Motley, it was just like a, a bat around the side of the head. You didn't know really anything about him. Like you was there to see Ozzy. Oh, who's this band that comes on? Holy right. shit. And what, what Motley basically had done, I mean, think about it. Molly Crew, Nikki Six behind Gene is probably the smartest guy in, in the rock and roll business. Kiss comes out in what, 72, 73. They do most of the 70s records, live records, makeup, costumes, fire, the whole deal. But by 1980 or 81, but was the elder in 1980, they took their makeup off for that, right? No, that's when they had like really weird short hair, but with the makeup. Oh, okay. And like, then they had like a new guy with like Vinny was the Ankh warrior or something in it. So basically Kiss takes off all the, the, the makeup. Kiss takes off the shiny, you know, warrior costumes. Molly Crew forms in 81. Later in 81, they put out Too Fast for Love. But in 82, as 83 is about to happen, they record the record. And basically Nikki goes, oh, they're not using their costume. They're not using their makeup. I think I'll borrow that. So when Motley Crue came out and the shout at I mean, you look at those videos for Looks That Kill, Too Young to Fall in Love, that is Kiss. But by this point, Kiss was all dressed down. Paul Stanley's in a pair of jeans with just high heel boots. You know, oh, hell's breaking loose. You know, they're just walking around New York City and in kind of street clothes with a, you know, a fancy belt or maybe some jewelry. But Motley Crue came out. They were in this Mad Max warrior fucking take on the world and set it on fire and then walk away, which is what Kiss used to be like in the 70s. So that's why I think Motley Crue had a way bigger impact on me. And they're also a decade. They're a decade younger than everybody in Kiss at that point. And you made out with a girl at the concert. I did up in the nosebleed during Ozzy. And at the end they played so tired and I was kind of sad that I didn't, I didn't get to see her anymore. After that. <laughs> Have you ever wondered what would happen if you'd not gone to that show? Yeah. Do you think you'd have seen another gig at some point and it had the same effect? Who knows? Because my, my whole life before that, from the age of about eight or nine was for the better part of, you know, seven, eight, nine years, a decade, I was obsessed with skateboarding. I wanted to be what Tony Hawk became or Steve Caballero was or Christian Astoy, you know, I was completely obsessed with skateboarding, of being a skateboarder, getting sponsored, getting my own signature model, which is kind of like getting signed. Just to jump forward a little bit, once you got out to California, was you able to pursue any of that or cross paths with anybody or check out any of the punk bands or anything like that? Once I joined Tough, everything previous to that in my life had kind of stopped. It ceased to exist because I was blinded to the outside world. I mean, it was me, Michael, Todd, and George. It was us four against the world. Nobody was stopping us. Nobody was changing our mind. Nobody was getting in our way. We didn't care what anyone said, what anyone did. And at some point we were like, yeah, this is us. So I remember as much as I was a football fan and as much as I like sports, there was a period in the first several years of tough. I didn't watch one Packer game. Didn't wake up on Sunday to say, I want to watch the football games or the, you know, NBA. None of that. I mean, I paid attention to nothing outside of my little music world and what was tough going forward. So skating ceased to exist. At some point, I did have a skateboard here and I would use it to skate to the store to buy food or something. But I didn't go to any skate parks, didn't go to any punk shows, didn't hang out with anybody in that world at all until a full 10 years later in 1996. Tough had ended and I, I kind of was reinvigorated because the X Games had started and the X Games was making a huge push and it became like commercialized on TV and there was all these uh, events happening. And that, that was, you know, like, again, almost a decade later, Tough had come to its initial end and I was working a normal job. I was 30 years old and okay, Tough is done and now I'm going to ride my skateboard again and work a job. So that's what happened. You mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, you always had your sights set on bigger things. And if I've got this right, some friends of yours would bring back some flyers from their trips to the West Coast. And you'd eventually see one which had 
the band Tough on and an ad saying they needed a new singer. And what you did after that is like amazing and one of the ballsiest moves ever. You called the number and you were told you need to send a promo package to get an audition, but instead you just flew out (coughs) with a one-way ticket to Hollywood. Right, I'm just going to go straight to that audition. What happened is the exact breakdown was a friend of mine who I grew up with since grade school named Al was a drummer. And he had come out to Hollywood late May, early June of 1987. And he came out here to check out the scene, to go to the clubs. At this point, I'd already been playing around in Exciter, the various bands I was playing with in Wisconsin in you know, 85, 86, into early 87. And Al came back and he called me. It was a Friday. He literally called me in the afternoon. He said, Steve, I just got back from Hollywood. Man, dude, it was insane. You would not believe all the stuff I saw. Like, dude, I saw David Lee Roth at the Rainbow. And I was like, really? Like, I was blown away by this. He goes, yeah, I have all this, I have all these magazines. And he's like, you got to come over, dude. I want to tell you about it. So I was like, okay. So I literally got in my car. I drove to Al's house, went in his basement where he had all his drums set up. And we just talked about everything. You know, he told me about going to these clubs and and then he's like, check this out. And he had all these magazines, like a Rock City News, BAM Magazine, LA Weekly, and then all the different flyers and ticket stubs and promotional stuff that people had handed out, tapes. As I'm looking through it, he's telling me his stories. You know, oh, I went here, I saw this guy, and I'm looking through all the stuff. And the tough flyer had popped up. Now, about eight months earlier in the fall of 86, a girl I had dated from Wisconsin had come out here for like a vacation, like for a couple of weeks or something. She had actually met Tough and hung out with them. And so when she came back, she had shown me all her stuff. And one of the flyers was a Tough flyer. But at this point, it was still Jimmy in the band. And I specifically remember it because the, the logo is, that's like a branding iron into your eyes, right? You can't forget that logo. And I remember everybody in the band looking cool, but Jimmy had really short hair, almost like Billy Idol. It was really white. And then she she even said, oh, but the singer got hair extensions now. They look really good. And I was like, wow, his hair is like really short, like almost Billy Idol short. She's like, oh, yeah, but he got these hair extensions and they look awesome. And at that point, my hair was kind of short, meaning like Leaf Garrett short, though, not Billy Idol short. So I was like, oh, really? OK, cool. But they look like a cool band. I thought they looked awesome. And then she showed me other stuff and told me about where she went and hung out in Orange County or Venice Beach or whatever. So now fast forward, it's now June of 87 and Al's handing me all the stuff. And as I'm going through it, I see the Tough logo and it's the four squares, Michael, Todd, George, and then the middle square is empty. And it said wanted lead singer influenced by and it listed Vince Neil, David Lee Roth, Brett Michaels, Robin Zander and Billy Idol was actually one of them as well. And I thought, I love all those singers, mostly Roth and Vince Neil, because Poison was a pretty new band at that point. I saw them one time in the fall of 86, but at that point they weren't that big because Cry Tough was their only single and they were opening for Quiet Riot. The Talk Dirty to Me single came out winter months of 86 into 87. So it wasn't until early 87 that Poison had really blown up and started getting regular play and appearing in the magazines. So when it said Brett Michaels, I was like, oh, I, you know, everyone thinks I look like that guy from Poison. And at this point, they had been a band that I had known about for less than a year, maybe eight months. But I loved, you know, Van Halen. I loved Motley Crue, Cheap Trick. And then uh, I said, Al, can I take this flyer? Can I take this number down? I need to call this number. He goes, oh, dude, take it all. I don't, I don't want any of that stuff. It was all these glam rock flyers. So I took it, went home that night, called the number, and it was a studio, a rehearsal studio in Canoga Park called Rocking Horse. And I called it, and they took the message for the band because they said the band's phone got turned off. They didn't have a phone. And she said, when they come in, we give them their messages. But you need to, you know, mail a package if you want. They wanted, you know, demo, biography, resume, press, Whatever I, you know, promotional eight by 10, you know, headshots, whatever. And and I had some stuff, but it just, it wasn't of quality. And that's what I said, eh, this isn't going to be convincing enough. So I made my mind up over that weekend to move out of my apartment, move my stuff into my mom's house. On Monday, I bought the flight. The flight was on Thursday. And on Thursday night, I was here. So from the time I saw the flyer until I was at LAX was less than a week. You could have gone down the Alex Michael route. I'm sure he's told you the story when he needed to send a demo out and they didn't have one. He sent a copy of the Tough demo. Alex did that. Yeah. I thought that was fucking genius. 
we kind of sound like this band, so we'll send yeah, that. Yeah, I thought that was pretty funny, too, when he told me that years later. So good. Now, considering how many bands and musicians were on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood at that time, is it kind of odd that Tuff hadn't tried to poach someone from another band which they knew? I mean, for all I know, they could have. They could have. But, you know, the thing is, I mean, which is what Warrant did, you know, because Warrant was Eric, Jerry, and Josh, and a singer named Adam Shore and a drummer named Max, that was Warrant, who had opened up for all the Poison shows when Matt Smith was the guitarist. And then what happened is Adam Shore and Max quit Warrant, if I'm not mistaken, and they formed a band called Hot Wheels, which Robbie Crane went on to play bass in. And when those guys left, Eric had remembered seeing this band called Plain Jane play the Troubadour or something. So then those guys thought, let's try to get that guy from plain Jane. He was a good front man. And I guess, you know, they went to his apartment, they left a message. I think Jane even says that he was getting ready to leave town and go back to Florida or Ohio. He's originally from Ohio, but he had lived in Florida playing the cover scene. So after the plain Jane band was getting ready to break up, I guess Janie was thinking about moving back. But the guys in Warren said, do you want to be in our band? But Janie said that he was interested, but he would only consider if they would let him bring his drummer with him, which was Stephen. Stephen Sticky Sweet. If I'm not mistaken, that's when Eric said, well, that's crazy. We need a drummer too. <laughs> because Adam was the singer Max was the drummer. Those guys quit to form Hot Wheels. Was meant to be, that was. Yeah, so that was meant to be. And so as far as Tough trying to poach a singer, who knows? They might have looked at some other guys. They might have confronted, you know, asked some guys, like, hey, are you interested in jamming with us? But for whatever reason, it, it didn't work. But when I came, they had already had a, a new singer. They had a guy named Dastin Luss, D-A-S-T-I-N-L-U-S-S, -S, or Lust, maybe. Dastin Lust, and he was from... Vegas, and they'd met him somehow, and they had basically started to, I guess, what would be the word, um, settle because they couldn't find somebody. And so, not only did they have him proposing to be their singer, he was already living with them. They already let him move in. So, in the apartment they lived in, or the Tough Muff Mansion, as we called it, 13956 Van Owen Street, cross street is Hazeltine, Van Nuys, California. Two bedroom apartment, Todd and George in one room, Michael was in the other room. The singer that they had hired, this Daston guy, he was staying in the living room and had some shit in the closet or something. I guess he had rehearsed with them a few times and was staying with them for a matter of maybe days or weeks, but they weren't really digging him. So when I came into the picture, they came to meet me. After I got a return phone call, Michael calls me, starts asking, you know, who I am, where I live, what I look like, what do I sound like, what am I into, how old am I? Remind me what you look like. <laughs> yeah, the, the number one, what do you look like? They came to the, the apartment I was staying at, which was really close to where they lived as well. And then they said, okay, we're going to check your stuff out. Like I played them some of my demo, the Exciter demos. And then they wanted me to come to a rehearsal that they were doing a couple days later, but it wasn't to audition. They just wanted me to come down and check it out. And so I went with a friend of mine, Lonnie, a girl took me. And when I got there, Tuff was rehearsing with Dastin, the original singer, the singer that they had been working into the band. So I come into the rehearsal room with Lonnie as a friend and I'm watching them rehearse as tough with Daston. Then Lonnie's brother shows up, a guy named Dave Huey Huey, who was formerly security guard for Poison. So Lonnie is Dave's younger sister. She brought me and Dave Huey Huey showed up with Jim Gillette. Was they still on good terms with Jim then? Yes. He was on good terms, even though there was a little animosity between him and Todd. He quit because he wanted to do a heavier band. And he was also selling his vocal tapes, which were blowing up. And he wanted to do heavier stuff faster guitar, more screams, and they didn't want to do that. They wanted to keep it more party rock, Van Halen, Rat, Motley Crue, Poison, whatever. So th the first time I went to go see Tuff just rehearse, it was them rehearsing with Dastin singing. And then I was on one side of the rehearsal room with Lonnie, the girl. And then Dave, her brother, was on the other side of the room with Jim Gillette. And then Dastin wasn't really doing that well of a job. He was even reading the lyrics off the like the pages. And he'd do two songs and he'd leave the room and used the bathroom. And there was some tension between those guys. And I think there was probably tension as well that they had me sing sitting in there and then their old singer. And so at some point during that rehearsal, Jimmy 
actually Jim Gillette got up and sang a couple songs with them. How did that sound? Like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, they were doing like Candy Coated and Glamour Girls and, you know, basically the, the stuff you hear, you know, and he'd sing kind of, you know, like typical rock and roll sounding vocals on there. But then all of a sudden he'd throw this Jeff Tate scream in out of the middle of nowhere and it'd just be like, it just didn't sound right. You know, I mean, it's insanely powerful and he could scream like without the PA. I mean, he was one of those singers too, where he'd be singing it. And when he'd scream, he'd hold the mic like a foot away from his face because his voice was so powerful. Because you'd seen the previous singer. Did it give you confidence going in? Almost like you got a bit of a cheat sheet. I was like, I could fucking smoke that guy. I could smoke that guy right now. I'd already been listening to the songs for two days. I'm like, I could get up there and sing those songs right now. Very confident. I mean, whether it was considered cocky or arrogant, I don't know, but I was extremely confident from the get-go. And not only did I need that, but they needed that. They needed someone to be able to walk onto the Sunset Strip two weeks later with flyers and say, hey, I'm Stevie Rochelle. I'm the singer from Tough. We're opening for Warrant in three weeks. Come and see us. And from the second we did that, from the second we started walking the strip as a group, you know, as like, hey, well, now this is us. New photos, flyers, the whole deal. The buzz was almost literally overnight without exaggeration. And anybody from that era would tell you the same. Did you instantly slip into that Hollywood band lifestyle pretty easily? Did you ever feel like the new kid or the fish out of water? Or was you just running on that combination of confidence, youth? No, not at all. I was immediately if not the guy, one of the guys, you know, but I just didn't, I didn't fall into the category of the parties or, you know, the drugs or the crazy drinking, but womanizing and just being about the scene. Immediately, I had a million friends. You know, the, here's the comparison. When Molly Crew was playing around the Sunset Strip, as a local band, if I'm not mistaken, Motley Crew played the Santa Monica Civic Center which holds like 4,000 people. They played there as a local band on New Year's Eve and sold it out. That's a small arena. That's a pretty big fucking deal, you know? But nobody else knew about Motley Crue in early 81 or early 82. I mean, a few people like total diehards, but this Too Fast for Love thing they were doing, when Elektra Records came in a year later and said, we'll sign you guys, let's make a new record. Hey, not only are we going to put out Shout at the Devil, but it's going to be a gatefold. The first record, we would open it up and be like, what the fuck? This band is Kiss's worst nightmare, right? I mean, just, and they just looked the part. So when the world got exposed to them, everybody was like, oh my God, this band is fucking amazing. Same thing with Tough. When I joined the band Tough, I'm in a, an apartment in Van Nuys. And we're like, okay, tonight we go to our first photo shoot. Two days later, we see the photos. Now we have a, a show booked with Warren. Michael immediately said, he knew we needed to make a statement. We didn't just make a half ass flyer. You saw some old school flyers. You saw the ones we had were as well put together as anybody's national act. Full page in BAM magazine for our first ever show. Full page ad, you know, $1,000, $800. Had our phone number, our address, call us for tickets, call us for food, you know, to deliver, call us for sex, whatever. <laughs> immediately the phone just started blowing up. Like all the girls that looked through the magazine, like, oh my God, who was that? Kind of like what happened with the promoters in St. Louis or Kansas City that put up this big poster and said, hey, this band from California is going to come. And everybody was like, oh my God, we have to see them. They look like Motley Crue or Poison. You mentioned it briefly a while ago, but I think one thing that would perhaps surprise people about Hollywood back then and proves how big the Sunset Strip scene was and how many bands were coming out there. There are actually businesses specializing in rocker hair extensions. Yeah. Even advertising in magazines and stuff. That's just unreal that that was a thing. Yeah. One of the places that was really popular was called Antenna, which the name, if you think about it, what does an antenna do? It sticks up really high. And they're basically like, they want, you know, that's aside from people adding length to their hair with extensions, a lot of punkers like, rockabilly and stuff you know stray cats whatever they i mean the front of their hair would be up you know everybody's hair was huge so long hair rocks antenna sherry adams hair magic she specialized in extensions for bands and and not just bands but people on movie sets that were acting and working in a movie set like you know beyond thunderdome or mad max warrior kind of you know with all kinds of clothing and hair pieces or whatever super you said like Michael, your drummer was like really focused and incredibly business minded and had a big influence on you. He was already a dad, but still chasing the dream of being in a successful band. How much did that come into play with Tough or was that 
the catalyst that kind of drove him so passionately to make it happen, do you think? You know, what's crazy too is Michael was the youngest one. So when I joined Tough, I was 21. I was the oldest guy. Todd was 20. George was 20. Michael was 19. So George turned 21 in August. Todd turned 21 in September. We were all 66, but they were like six months younger than me. Michael turned 20 in December of 87. But he had already had a kid. Like you said, he, he became a father, I think, at 18 in the fall of 86. So he would have been he would have been 18. He wouldn't have been 19 yet. And um, Michael's parents in Phoenix, they were very involved with helping raise Stefan. Stefan did come out. Uh, his son did come out and stay with, you know, with us at the band apartment occasionally. Michael and his, you know, the mother of the child, Chris. She was actually underage. They were dating since she was like, I want to say 14 and Michael was say 17. But very shortly after she got pregnant. So when she had the kid, she might have been 15 or maybe 16 tops. And Michael was only 18, 18 and a half. And so, yeah, I mean, it's not easy for an 18 and a 16 year old to raise a baby especially if the 18 year old is a drummer in a rock band in Hollywood. <laughs> but you know, the good thing is that Phoenix is a 45 minute plane ride away. And Michael and Chris, they stayed, you know, together here part of the time, but there was also dissension, you know, they, they were fighting, they were young kids. So Michael's parents at some point were very involved with Stefan staying there for periods of time, especially when we go on the road, you know? So yeah, Michael was having to try to balance being a father and managing the band. And also, even though being the youngest, being the most mature out of all of us to try to keep everybody in line. Yeah, legend. One of the interesting points you've made, because Tough worked incredibly hard for several years before you got your deal. What you've said, though, is once you sign that deal, you're effectively immediately starting from scratch again, but on a whole other level. You're not certainly not going to sit back in your chair and think, oh, now we can relax and let the record company do it all again. Was that kind of daunting or was it still just exciting because you'd work so hard for it? It was exciting. But, you know, we're young at this point. Now it's 1990. So when we got the deal memo that said we were getting signed, I just turned 24. And again, I'm the old guy. But I do remember thinking to myself, I'm 24. Fuck, you know, Skid Row's record's already been out for a couple of years. And Sebastian's a couple of years younger than me. I think he was 19 years old when he recorded the debut. And he was 20 when it came out and turned 21 shortly after. But um, you can't get yourself too worked up over who's more successful, who's younger, who's older, who's got more money. Some of those things go into your head, but they quickly evaporated. But the thing we did realize is that our competition now, once we're signed, it's no longer Taz, Paradise, New Haven, Hot Wheels, Preacher, you know, Hysteria, whatever the local bands were, Rock Dolls, you know, it was hundreds and hundreds. Little by little, you know, to get signed was a big deal. Jizzy Pearl had recently done a podcast where he talked about it being every time somebody got signed, it was like there was one less golden ticket. It's like the Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. There's six tickets and six candy bars somewhere, and whoever gets the ticket gets to go. So Motley Crue, Rat, Dawkins, Black and Blue, Keel, you know, all products from the Sunset Strip, Slayer, Metallica, Armored Saint, you know, all bands that played the scene. And then, you know, now we're coming into the next era where Poison gets a deal. Then Guns N' Roses, L.A. Guns, Faster Pussycat, Jet Boy. And then the next wave is suddenly Warrant gets signed. Bang Tango gets signed. Bullet Boys get signed. Pretty Boy Floyd gets signed. And as every band gets signed, and everybody had a different route, because a band like Pretty Boy Floyd, love them or hate them, they literally played their first show. It was huge. They played six or seven more shows. Inside a year, they played like eight shows once a month or so, and they got signed. And there was a lot of us that were playing around for two years, three years, four years. Warrant had had, a, you know, six, eight different guys in and out of the band. Poison went through several years of playing around and changing the guitarist. And Pretty Boy Floyd put the band together. And, you know, eight, ten months later, they're recording for MCA. What was the secret to that? You know, it was on their side. I mean, the songs were great. Ariel had written some great songs. They looked the part. They had youth on their side. And they were, you know, the, the second or third coming of what Kiss or Motley Crue. It was very much like that. But, um, you know, as everybody gets a deal, you know, you have to go to a different level now. Of course, then, you know, Tough gets signed and Salty Dog and Wild Side. But our competition is no longer what's happening at the Roxy or the Troubadour. Now we're competing with not only who's on our label, 
but who's in the entire music industry? We're going to compete for radio spins on the radio, for video plays on the MTVs, for space in the magazines, Hit Parade or Rip, Kerrang, Metal Forces, Circus, Metalix, Powerline, whatever's out there, Faces, so many magazines. And here's a great breakdown, which I do in the Tough Diaries. If anybody's ever read any of the Tough Diaries, I encourage you to go to toughcds.com, dig around, or go to Metal Sludge and find them. The year that Tough put out our debut on Atlantic Records, that same year, just on Atlantic Records, just on the same label in the same category of rock and roll, ACDC put out a record. Rush put out Roll the Bones. Skid Row put out Slave to the Grind. Mr. Big came out. Now, Mr. Big coming out of the box, they have perhaps the greatest rock bass player in the history of music. And some guy named Paul Gilbert from Racer X in the band. And some guy named Eric Martin, who's, a, you know, a vocal freak, you know. So, you know, we're up against those bands. Then we're up against Saigon Kick, who is through Atlantic. Foreigner had a release. Of course, they have a catalog of Led Zeppelin on Atlantic, and there's always reissues and remasters and Robert Plant solo records and Genesis and Phil Collins are in Atlantic. Who is Winger on? I think Winger was through Atlantic as well. Tattoo Rodeo, even though it didn't go big, it got a lot of push because like the head of the label was really behind them. Was Bad Company on that as well? They could have been, you're right. <laughs> So, I mean, right there off the top of my head and your head in a matter of a minute, we listed about a dozen rock bands. So now the head of the label, the president of the label, the head of A&R, all these genius minds have to get together and say, well, hey, how much money do we have to spend on tour support for bands this summer? Well, we got to give Rush a million bucks. We got to give Skid Row $500,000. We got to give ACDC this amount of money. Okay, how much money do we have to push radio singles? Well, we got to push the new ACDC single. We got to push the new Skid Row single. They just sold 5 million off the first record. We got to push this Paul Gilbert, Billy Sheenan project because these guys are a super group. We got to push this Foreigner song because Foreigner had previously sold, you know, double, triple, platinum, three, four records in a row. So now all this attention is being focused on Mega Band, Arena Band, Rush, ACDC, Skid Row, this band that kicks. Forgot about Kicks. Kicks had put out their fourth or fifth record. Uh, what was it? Hotwire. And, and they've already been around for 10 years and put out three or four records. So we have to compete with all the record labels saying, put money into ACDC, put money into Skid Row, put money here, do this for these guys. And there's only so many people at the label in New York City or the LA office or the Chicago office. And then they have a rep in Detroit and a couple reps in Atlanta and a couple in Denver and one in Vegas and two in Phoenix. And all of those people at some point are being told what to do. And that's where the word priority comes in. If the label prioritizes your band and makes you, this is what we're pushing. Very famously quoted, Janie Lane talks about, when I came into Columbia's office, there's cherry pie stuff everywhere, blah, blah, blah. It was huge. Everything was cherry pie. A year later, two years later, when they were releasing the Dog Eat Dog record, he said that he came in there. Was it Alice in Chains that were on the same record? I think it was. I remember it being Alice in Chains. What he yeah, said, the Alice in Chains stuff was all over the main office. And Janie said, I realize it's their turn. They're not going to push Dog Eat Dog. They're not going to push this like they push Cherry Pie. You know, this is my third record. Things are changing. It's no longer the pop glam 80s. It's now 90. 293. And so when you're a priority at the label, that's where you can get some real traction. And as good as Skid Row is or was, as great as that band was with those songs, as awesome as Sebastian is as a singer, as much as he looked like the prototypical perfect frontman, looks, voice, hair, tall, skinny, smile, charisma, psychopath, you know, like all that stuff. He had all that, but they also had the most powerful manager in the rock and roll business. Doc McGee, Kiss, Motley, Bon Jovi, Scorpions, all the biggest bands. Oh, we're going to help out these guys called Skid Row, too. Oh, and guess what? Dave went to school with the singer, whose name is John, you know? <laughs> John, at this point, became, you know, has become the most successful and probably the most wealthy guy from the decade, along with Gene Simmons. John Bon, bon Jovi's worth a half a billion dollars. So having John say to Doug Morris or Ahmed Erdogan from Atlantic, yeah, 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 we're going to take him on the tour. We're going to take him on the whole tour. No, 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 around the whole world. We're going to take Skid Row from day one till we're done with the tour. 
150 dates, arenas and stadiums around the world. And then Doc goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're going to take them to the Moscow thing too. We'll push them out there and have them do some songs before Scorpions and Motley Crue and Bon Jovi. You know, so when Doc says this and John says this, now Atlantic's got to go, they've got to come to the party. They've got to throw down. And of course, it didn't hurt that they had a great band, a great look. Timing was perfect. They dialed back on the glam, went a little dirtier. You know, you can't deny those songs. But you switch some parts around. Let Skid Row be managed by Brian Kushner in Power Star and play a couple of club dates with Britney Fox. Let Tuff be managed by Doc McGee and go on a Bon Jovi arena tour around the world. There's a real crazy little fine line where the polar shift can be the difference in selling 100,000 records or selling 3 million records. And we we learned all that when we got on Atlantic. You know, it's like, it's a big competition out there. And all those bands we just talked about that are on Atlantic just releasing a record in 91, that's just Atlantic. Let's talk about what we had to compete against that was on Warner Brothers. And Geffen. Or Geffen. <laughs> Or Scotty Brothers or MCA, you know, like it's a pretty big mountain to climb. So looking back at what we did and what we can still be proud of today and coming full circle to do this 30th anniversary reissue, there's not a lot of guys that go in front of a mirror at 16 or 17, putting on a record in their bedroom and decide to strum the tennis racket or pretend they're singing. There's not a lot of us that get to go and sign to Atlantic or be on MTV or be a pinup and hip raider or go around the world in a tour bus or be on the straight to video podcast. Like there's not a lot of us. <laughs> what clicked for you with MTV though? Cause that single was huge. I remember when that came out, I was on vacation in the States cause my dad lives over there right. and I remember seeing it. Right. Cause that was, just, what was it behind Metallica and who else was it? Guns and Roses. This right here, since you're looking this, you know what this is? This is the weekly playlist for MTV. This is dated July 26th, 1991. This has got every video that was played on MTV that week. And it's in order of priority. Like the top thing says video ads. There's about 10 bands that got added to MTV that week. 10. The one highlighter right there, that's tough. So think about that. This week, MTV adds 10 bands. This is really kind of mind boggling when you start breaking things down like this. That week, MTV added Metallica, Enter Sandman, Color Me Bad, The Firm, Poison, Tony Childs, Tough, Chris Whitley, and King of the Hill. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I take that back. Only eight bands got added. Not ten, eight. So out of all the labels, Geffen, MCA, Atlantic, Warner Brothers, Scotty Brothers, Columbia, name every record label that put out a record with all their acts. And this is not just heavy metal, you know, bands like Color Me Bad, that was kind of like an R&B kind of hip hop. So all the bands that submitted videos that week, only eight of them get added to the playlist. And then it shows here what's in Heavy Rotation, Metallica, and like one other exclusive rotation and this is including bands that were previously in rotation from like the week before the two weeks before exclusives then a stress rotation active rotation and then hot new video so there's like six or eight categories we were in active which that week there was two four six eight ten 12, 14, 16, 18. There was 19 videos in active rotation that week, one of which was tough. To get on this playlist is like getting on 150 radio stations at one time. Because at this point in the early 90s, the potential viewers for MTV was over 50 million viewers at any given time were watching the TV show. Visual and audio. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so why they chose it? I mean, Atlantic submitted videos like they do with everybody. Here's the tough video. Here's the Mr. Big video. Here's the winger video. Here's the skid row video. Here's the ACDC, but whatever. And at some point they have meetings and there's a programming director, a music director that make decisions. They watch part of the clip. And just like with you, if somebody comes up to you and says, Rob, check out my song, check out my band. You put your ears on, put it in and you're immediately like, okay, I'm not impressed. This is not good. I don't like it. It's only 20 seconds and I'm dying. Please let this stop, right? Or you're like, wow, this is great. I really like this. I'm going to listen further. What's the next track? Same thing happens with these programming directors at radio stations or the video directors. They look at the content. Is this any good? No. Put the next one in. 
no, what is this? Wow. He, and the, the woman that was program director at that time, she said something to the effect that this band is made for MTV. The singer is a star. The girls are going to lose their mind after school when they see him. Something to that effect. They gave us a phone call and my manager calls and says, MTV added you guys. We thought we were going to be on like Headbangers Ball at 2.30 in the morning. Nope. Active rotation. Our very first spin ever on MTV was on a weekday on a Monday at 3.06 p.m. And you know what? what happened at 3 p.m. that day? I know what happened, yeah. <laughs> the world premiere of Metallica and her Sandman. Which I know for a fact they've been building up and teasing for like yeah. two weeks beforehand. The biggest band in the world is about to debut their new song, which was getting a huge buzz. And Tough was the follow-up song to follow that. So as much as we didn't get all the love for everything, MTV at some point came to the table and said, we love this band. We're putting them in rotation. And everybody called us and were like, even the A&R girl was like, I can't believe this. She's like, Stevie, you have no idea how big of a deal this is, which I did. But now I know even more. It's, it's huge looking back. Superb, man. Superb. How was it for you visiting the UK for the first time with Tuff? Was it part of the American Dream Tour at this store? It was. It was like the first, second week of October, maybe the 12th or something like that. You was the first one. I think Danger Danger was the last band after like six weeks, but you were the first band. Yeah, I think did Badlands do it and Bang Tango as well. A couple different. Yeah. So yeah, that was a promotion put together by some promoters in England called the American Dream with Tuff, Bang Tango, Badlands, whoever, Danger Danger. And what they did is they flew us in and then we did a whole week worth of press. We did stuff for Kerrang! and every magazine throughout England and Europe. We did some little snippets for whatever the MTV outlet, you know, DJs were, VJs. Photo shoots, which appeared in Kerrang!, one of which I have this contents page. Remember that? Ah, nice. Very cool. With the tough ring. Didn't you review the singles in Raw magazine as well? Yeah. Did single reviews and all kinds of stuff. The whole week was full. They took us out to clubs. They took us out to dinner. And then we played the Astoria to a nearly sold out packed house. As I mean, what is the story of 1,500 seats? Yeah, between 1,500 to 2,000. I mean, it's not there anymore now. Yeah. It's demolished. Right. Had a great time. The in-store was at Shades the next day, but I got food poisoning that night. I couldn't make it. I woke up in the middle of the night. I was projectile vomiting. I was on my deathbed, I thought. So the in-store was Todd, George, and Michael without me. And then, of course, you know, a couple of days later, we flew home and continued our tour back into Florida and driving into the Midwest and going west with the last couple of dates of the tours, you know, looming as we were getting ready to go home for a break before the Lita Ford tour. And that's when our truck got stolen in Memphis, Tennessee. So the truck got stolen about a week removed from being in England. Did you enjoy your time in England, though, other than the food part? I loved it. Loved it. And, you know, since I've been back, you know, probably, what, five times or something like that? With Easily. Top Shameless yeah. a couple of times. Yeah. Always enjoyed it. Did you get the chance to meet up with people you've been perhaps talking to or sending letters to? Because obviously Kelv Hellraiser, rest in peace, was a big champion of you guys. That's how I first heard about you. And I think he wrote something in Metal Forces. And that's how well you guys worked and connected was I knew of you as being like this hot band on Sunset Strip before you'd been signed. Right. And like, oh, it's just a matter of time before Tough gets signed. Right. And that was a year or 18 months before your album came out or whenever before you got signed. That's that's how much of a buzz you guys managed to create pre-internet. It's it's unreal. It's great. Kelv was awesome. I miss him. You know, Kelv was the best. Kelv and Stevie James were the first two people I had met from England out here at the Rainbow and we hung out. And at that point, I think Stevie was still in the band, but I think at that point stuff was just about about getting it was getting ugly like between him and the rest of the guys so and i had met them you know a couple different times they came and we hung out and they were always super cool to us kelv obviously uh i think dave reynolds was another guy that wrote for about a lot of euro magazines dave reynolds a good dude yeah, yeah. then there was other ones too from you know denmark and belgium and different zines which we didn't have as much exposure to them over here but Kerrang! was distributed over here pretty well. I had been seeing Kerrang! magazine since 83 or 84, and Metal Forces I had seen as well. Yeah, I mean, there was people we had occasionally met, you know, that had come to, to L.A. and been at a show, and then right. we'd run into them in some other country or some other state. And everybody in England was always really cool to us. I just wish that we could have gotten there more sooner, played more dates, or maybe toured with somebody, opened up for somebody to play all over, you know, the area, as opposed to just coming out for a week. How's your relationship with Hollywood now? Is that a pretty open-ended question? Well, you know, the thing is, I live in Chatsworth. 
Chatsworth, California is the porno capital of the world. This is where most of the porn that you watched over the last 30 years has been made. (laughs) And in the San Fernando Valley, where I live is about 25 miles from Hollywood, 25 miles north into the valley, as they call it. I've always lived in the valley. Reseda is in the valley. Van Nuys is in the valley. North Hollywood is in the valley. It's weird because North Hollywood is in the valley. It's technically Hollywood is in is in L.A. is is on the other side of the hill. And West Hollywood is where all the clubs are. And Southwest Hollywood is is more of what they call Boys Town, where the gay community, Santa Monica Boulevard, a lot of clubs that are Boys Town is what they call it. WeHo. So there's WeHo, West Hollywood. And Northwest Hollywood is where Gazaris and Troubadour and the Whiskey and all the clubs are. Then there's East Hollywood, but North Hollywood is technically totally separate, even though it's called Hollywood, North Hollywood. But I always lived in the Valley. I haven't went to the clubs in the last year because they haven't been open. But the last many years, 10 years or so, I don't frequent that area that often because I've been raising kids. You know, my kid's mom would take them to school. I would pick them up. And then after school is homework and karate and after school activities and different things like that. And being a dad with two kids and running around and doing all that stuff. At some point when it's suddenly seven, eight, nine o'clock and somebody says, Hey, do you want to go down to the whiskey to see Lynch Mob at 11:30? I'm like, oh, that's like 30 minute drive, parking. You know, I'm already tired. I've been up, running around with kids. I don't know if I'm gonna make it tonight. You know, so <laughs> sweet man. So finally, how has it been revisiting these songs 30 years? You've obviously been very hands on with the whole process, pulling this 30th anniversary album together. How long had it been since you like listened so closely to everything? Oh, I still I've still listened to it here in there but you know getting it remastered and really digging in with a quality set of headphones where you can really hear everything like you had said and other people have said wow these sound really good and i think like some other people had also said it's not like the record didn't sound good to begin with it sounded great but the technology we have in 2021 the last five, 10 years compared to what we had in 1990 is a world of difference. You know, mastering, getting something remastered essentially just makes everything a little bit louder. If you listen to an old CD and then you put in a brand new CD of, of, of a modern rock band. Fair Skid Row album. Yeah. Like if you put something in, if it goes to 30 and you put it on 20, then you put in a new CD, the new CD is going to sound like it's on 40 all of all of a sudden everything is going to be a little louder and a little bit more clear and the packaging it's deluxe packaging like i said we went from 12 to 16 pages a grip and new photos and some other bells and whistles that when people finally get it they're going to be stoked cds will ship in june at some point everything's in the manufacturing phase vinyl is a different animal i'm not sure how familiar you are with vinyl but when you get a vinyl record made the turnaround is is a pretty lengthy process and because there's a lot less vinyl plants and there's more demand not only a lot of people are making vinyl but labels themselves are contacting the plants to repackage remaster and re-release manufacture catalogs all the old kiss records Not one of them, but like 15 of them or 20 of them. All the old ACDC, Aerosmith, everything from the 70s and 60s, Beatles, Zeppelin, Genesis, Kansas, Foghat, Leonard Skinner, CCR, all that stuff is being repackaged, remastered and re-released. And so they've basically saturated the plants. And so when someone like an indie label calls and goes, hey, we got to run off some copies of the Tough record, we're not a priority. When a record label calls up and says, I have a catalog with 100 titles and we need 20,000 of each, it takes up the time. That's fair enough. It'll be worth it, though. Yeah, I don't have a shipping time right now on the on the vinyl, but the pre-orders have been rolling in and people are stoked and I can't wait to get it out to them. Sweet, man. Stevie, thank you ever so much, mate. It's been lovely to hear all these stories. I could I could go for about another two hours, but <laughs> people are like, I what the hell well. is he talking about? Where's he going with that? <laughs> Dude, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Tell all your guys over there. I said, hey, all the Teenage Casket Company guys. It's been great, man. Thank you so much. Okay, take care, bud. We'll see you later.
I really love chatting with the one and only Stevie Rochelle and want to thank him for his time and his ongoing support over the years. Please, if you can, head on over to toughcds.com to pre-order your copy of the 30th anniversary reissue of the Tough album What Comes Around Goes Around and also stay up to date with all things hard rock, glam metal, cock rock and hair metal, whichever name you want to choose, over at metalsludge.tv and dive into the Tough Diaries. These things are an uncensored warts and all account of Stevie's adventure in Hollywood and Tough's career and legacy. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you want to check out earlier shows, please visit stvpod.com and maybe consider picking up a t-shirt or showing some love for the show on our support page where you can buy me a coffee, which allows you to send a small donation of your choice to help go towards any costs needed to run the show. But to be honest, any support from a simple like, share or follow really makes a difference too. I'm continuing to put a bunch of new ideas together to coincide with episode 100 of the show in just a few weeks, so please stay in touch and get ready for all of that. I've babbled on way too much in this episode, so thanks for listening, take care of yourselves out there, and I look forward to chatting with you all again real soon. <laughs>